Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rido, joined as always by Boxing Hall of Famer, the great Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? I'm doing good, Ken. How are you? How's your family? How's your shoulder healing um, from that surgery? What, about three, four weeks ago now? Uh, I hope yep. you're paying attention to doctor's orders and you're not running. Or you're, you're, you're yep. not paying uh, I don't, I don't really He's see light that. Light jogging. Uh, light jogging. <laughs> okay. All right. Five weeks tomorrow. I'm almost back to full speed. Uh, sh my wife and kids, are uh, they have spring break this week, but I had too much work to do, so they went to see her sister in South Carolina, so I'm by myself this week. A nice uh, change of pace, but I miss the kids. Um, I like your shirt, by the way. Yeah, I like yours, too. That's, uh, that's good. <laughs> hey, how did the, real quick, how did the, for the, because I think everyone out there that's a parent can relate to this, especially a father. How did the father-daughter dance go? Oh, it was unbelievably fun. So much. It was so Because great. I saw the picture that you sent me. It really was great. It really was. I mean, she looked great. Uh, she looked beautiful. You were okay. <laughs> but you look proud. You look proud. Thank you. I was definitely proud. I, I love my daughter more than words can describe. Um it was excellent. It was like one of those things that I'll never forget for the rest of my life. You know, she's old enough now where we can have like real adult conversations. We went to the dance. Then we went and had dinner together. I said to her, let's go someplace fancy. And But you can pick. And she said, uh, okay, Cheesecake Factory at the mall. I was like, all right, Cheesecake Factory. Let's go. Well, that H, that's perf <laughs> perfect. As my grandson, Joseph, would say, perfect. I, I, I yep. ask him things, you know. I say, what do you think about... Uh, you know, there's simple things like when I pick them up at school. What do you think about going to uh, get a Happy Meal? Perfect. <laughs> Perfect, <laughs> Papa. And, of course, my grandson, Teddy the Fourth, and my t over in Vegas, and my granddaughter, Mara. I'm, I'm very blessed. We are all very blessed. And you see, when I bring this up for the great fans we have out there, don't you feel bad when you see we're human beings? Don't you feel bad <laughs> when you sometimes uh, say things that aren't as nice? You know, uh, very rarely, very rarely. <laughs> but when we disagree with you, don't you feel bad that, you know, that you're saying it to these decent <laughs> human beings that try to be as good as they can be? You know what you said about the Happy Meal? My wife sometimes will take the kids to McDonald's. And uh, my daughter's at that age now where she refuses to have her order her a Happy Meal. I said, but that's what you want is a cheeseburger and french fries. She's like, I know, but ba Happy Meals are for babies. I said, if I wanted a cheeseburger and french fries, I'd order a Happy Meal. <laughs> What's the difference? Yeah, you're But, gonna you know, be she's happy. at that age where. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> exactly. I want something a little less happy now that I just want to. I just want to touch on it real quick, as I did two weeks ago. Uh, I want to send all of our thoughts and prayers to the people of the Ukraine. Um, uh, I'm not going to say much about it. We all know what's going on over there. Uh, the inhumane things that are happening over there uh, with the attack on on these innocent people. Uh, I just want to say that I know, again, I speak for our audience. We all send our prayers and thoughts. And I wanted to add one thing to it. I was just thinking about it actually the last couple of days. I want to send our prayers and thoughts to all parts of the world where there's inhumane practices going on and different countries where people are being attacked. It's uh, yes, it's on all the news stations in the Ukraine, but it's more sometimes quietly happening in other areas of the world too, uh, where again, uh, just people are being treated the way people should not be treated. Uh, human beings should not be treated in the way that they're being treated in the Ukraine and in other parts of the world, in other countries that sometimes we don't talk about. So I, I just wish, I, I wish that my thoughts and our thoughts uh, could mean more than what they mean, that they could actually go out there and change things. Um, but 
we'll go on now with with another fight, the f- boxing world, the MMA world. We'll talk about that. And I want to, before we get started, Ken, I want to just go back to, I think it was our episode, I don't know if it was two episodes ago when we, part of the podcast was we were talking about the Catterall Taylor fight. And, you know, talking about, we agreed that it was a bad decision, but not the worst we've ever seen. And, but a bad decision. Catterall got the lead early on in the early half of the fight, maybe, you know, even a tiny bit past that. Uh, I thought Taylor, as I said then, was horrible. Uh, But his aggression means something. Obviously, he was the biggest, stronger guy. But Catero outboxed him, counterpunched him, you know, made him made him eat left hands um, quite a bit, uh, and should have gotten the decision. But we understand that boxing is not a fast sport, and we're brought to remember that and understand that quite too often. But there was fans that got like you know their underwear twisted, where. You know, they were like, how could you guys not go ballistic and go crazy that it was the worst of all time and, you know, that he that he won so big and how could you not be more, you know, vocal about that, more upset about that? You know, hey, first of all, calm down. <laughs> we thought that Catterall won, but I thought, and I think Ken was with me, A close fight, one or two points. Why? Because Catterall let his foot off the gas a little past the halfway point. I forget what round, eighth round, whatever it was. He let his foot off the gas. And when you let your foot off the freaking gas, people catch up. So I wanted to ask Ken, for all of you out there, Ken, you're a tremendous marathon runner. And you run in competitive classes. You know, you're not running with, you know, uh, your next door neighbors. Uh, So, I I don't think you are anyway. But for the most part, you're in all seriousness, you're running with top shelf guys. If you're ahead by a good distance, like Carnival was, if you're ahead after, let's say, the 15-mile mark, and you're ahead, but you suddenly get a pebble in your shoe, or you suddenly got a cramp, or you suddenly just decide not to run hard anymore, and you take your foot off the gas, Ken, uh, the way Catterall did, and you take your foot off the gas, at the end of the race, you still win. But would you win by the same margin that you were winning by at the 15-mile mark. Running from the front is almost... Please add to that for me. To me, is almost harder than running, uh, coming from behind or being in sight of the guy ahead of you. It's like you're running... I feel like when I get a big lead, I'm almost like running a little bit scared or at least I convince myself... Oh my God, they're closing on me. I don't want to let them. I don't want to like let them catch up to me. So my mentality is to like stay on the gas the whole time, to the extent to which I still think I can finish the race. But I definitely don't. Once I have a lead, I definitely then am running for time. And but that's not the question. If you were to let up, if you were to let up the way Catterall did, I don't think there's arguing that he took his foot off the gas because if there is, then the people, are, then I can't talk to you people. You're insane. Okay, then then there's no talking. So he let up. If you let up on the gas where you were winning, as I said, at the 15-mile mark, you know, you were winning big. But you let up yeah. uh, noticeably on the gas. Would you, would you expect to win by a mile or would you expect to win by maybe 100 yards? I mean, would it be would would it be closer? Yeah, I wouldn't be comfortable letting off the gas because you just never know what's going to happen down the stretch. But yeah, I wouldn't let off the gas. The the, the the people are trying to win just as bad as you are. I wouldn't give them an opportunity to even see me. 
I'd stay on the gas and hopefully, I, matter of fact, every time I turn a corner, if they can't see me, I'm sprinting. So when they come around the corner, oh my God, he's even further ahead now. So uh, yeah, no, I would never let off the gas. Well, he let off the gas. Do you agree? A hundred percent. All right. I think he thought he was further ahead than he was on the judges' scorecard. And I guess he forgot where he was fighting too, but whatever, you know, because he wasn't fighting at home. So he lets off the gas. We still give him credit. We still say that he crossed that finish line in first, but it was close. It was close, sir. It was close, sir. And these I people it was out closer, there, yeah. I'm going to ask Rob. Rob, you got one of those things where you could bleep? Can you bleep? You, we got bleeping capacities <laughs> because sometimes I think they're just Jack at bleep. <laughs> I, Jack, uh, bleep. I, I I think sometimes some of these people are Jack bleep because with an S. That's plural, by the way. Um, I, I I'm as everyone knows, I'm not an internet guy. You know, I'm a caveman. I'm prehistoric. Uh, I do have a fax machine. It's gone off a couple times during our shows, so that's been proven that I do have a fax machine. But for these people, you tell me, you reported to me, other people reported, my son uh, with the Raiders, you know, when he's got a spare minute and he never has a spare minute, um, working as, you know, as he does, as hard as he does <clears throat> out in Vegas with the Raiders. Uh, but when he does tell me that there's a couple complaints, and listen, everyone says it's remarkable how much love we get. Remarkable. And we appreciate all of it. We do. And we appreciate the people that disagree with us. We do. But I just sometimes, I just have to answer some of them when I hear about it that they're so, they're, they get so nuts that we didn't say, it wasn't enough that we said he won, Catterall, that we didn't say that, you know, he slaughtered the guy. Uh, you know, because again, he, he didn't. We're not the ones who let off the gas. Didn't you guys notice it? I, and I'll finish with this. I understand that f fans, you know, it, it's short for fanatic. And you get a, when you're fanatic, you get crazy. You get blurry. You get blurred with your emotions. So maybe you guys saw him continuing to run like the hare. You didn't see that he was the tortoise, you know, at certain spots that took a rest and the tortoise you know wound up winning which of course in those children books uh that ken used to read to his kids and i read to my grandchildren uh you know the tortoise won but not by much I think that th I think that because he was such an underdog and it was so surprising to people that it was that that he was winning that in their minds it almost he was winning by more. I thought when That's the true. fight ended it was close. I thought he won, but I look at one two rounds. There were some rounds that were close. I I don't know. Like you said at the beginning, there's been much much worse transgressions in the uh, world of boxing. But with that said, let's talk about a fight where remarkable the opponent the opponent didn't give it a chance to go to the judges. And that is the great Lee Wood finishing, stopping uh, Mick Conlon in the final as a big, of their fight As a big over. dog, big dog, right? Big dog. Oh, big dog. I don't know what the line was, but I remember seeing it and thinking like, oh. And he was the champion. He's the champion. And he and it was he was a big dog because he's fighting an undefeated, yeah. you know, get that signed with the power. He's, he's with the promote. He's with... Top rank, you know, he's he's the golden child, so to speak, Conlon. You know, he was a bronze medalist, 16 and all. He's he's supposed to, this is what's supposed to happen. He's supposed to fight for the title around 16 fights, you know, after being brought up, quite frankly, in a very hand-picked way, in a very careful way, in a very calculated way, uh, in a, you know, in a very gentle way, maybe some people could say, but uh, where they had control over everything, he, he gets brought up, and now he's supposed to go in there and get the title. I mean, that's what it's all about. But Mr. Wood uh, had a different idea, didn't he? Oh, to say the least, but I will say in the first probably three, four rounds, it looked like it was going to be just a one-sided beatdown. More than for three, four, even more than that. You're right. 
even more than that, Ken. The, the first two rounds in particular, I was like, oh, this is a massacre. What a, what a mismatch, especially after the knockdown in the first round. He didn't just knock him down. I mean, he had him flat on his back. Reminds me of Tyson Fury a little bit. Not quite as dramatic, but I mean, he was rocked and it took him several rounds to get his legs back. But my God, Lee Wood, holy crap, what a tough kid. What a like mentally and physically tough kid. He stayed in there, wore him down, chipped away, took almost every second of a 12 round fight to finally turn the tide. And then he got Mick Conlon on the ropes, caught him with a shot to the temple. Conlon was out on his feet. Uh, Lee hit him with a few additional shots, you know, on autopilot, just letting his hands go. And Mick Conlon, unfortunately, went right out the ring, straight down on his head uh, uh, to the outside of the ring. Thank God he's all right. But, man, scary moment for sure. Lee Wood showed nothing but class in telling the crowd to stop cheering after he realized Mick Conlon was down and hurt. Um, scary, scary moment there. Reminds you that, uh, you know, we don't play boxing. This is very serious business what you always say you're not the same you don't come out of the ring the same way you went in that's the uh th th that was that was evident in this fight but uh great win for lee woods he was super emotional at the press conference after it's just like everything you want to see from a fighter and a fight um the stuff of like hollywood legends this one I, it was just fantastic and i know you had a chance to watch it and i'm dying to hear what you think first of all I'll, I'll jump to the back end of it, and then I'll go to the front end of it, uh, because you touched on it already. I thought that the zone, that was the network that it was on, I, I thought that they did a poor job at the end, letting us, keeping us aware of the condition of Conlon, because we were all concerned. You you made a good point. Uh, Wood was very concerned, and he, and he showed true class, and really, for me, the action and behavior of a true champion, when he asked the crowd to quiet down, settle down, don't celebrate until we know that Conlon is okay. Because we didn't know. The way he went out of the ring, he got knocked out cold, then he falls out of the ring onto the, to the ground. And we don't know. And so he was very classy and responsible, Wood, and... So, and not allowing himself, his camp, to celebrate or the crowd until he knew. And we felt the same way as as fans, you know, as human beings. And they didn't do a good job of letting us know, you know, keeping us apprised of what the condition of Conlon was. I mean, you know, they didn't send anyone in the back. They didn't, they didn't come back with, listen... I would have loved to have known, which I found out afterwards, that he was back in his dressing room and he was, you know, uh, he, he, he was conscious. Uh, he was responding to questions. You know, I, I would have loved to have known that, but they didn't give us any knowledge of that. And we could only wonder and wonder in fear, quite frankly, like we're not hearing nothing, you know, uh, w what's going on? Is he on his, you know, what's going on? Uh, is he conscious? Is he on, are they getting ready to, is he on his way to the hospital? You know, we, it would have really, I felt be their responsibility to at least bring us up to speed on what they knew. And if they didn't know, find out, you know, I know sometimes it's hard, but in this case, it wasn't that hard. Send somebody back there and find out is he is he talking. So anyway, that was that was one of my my complaints because it it kind of dulled the night to that moment because you just saw an epic fight, an epic comeback, um, and just like Wood couldn't celebrate it yet, we we couldn't get too crazy either. Because we're still wondering, okay, it was an epic comeback, but is there tragedy uh, attached to it? Um, it? It changes the picture. Uh, it changes it for me, and I'm sure it changes it for everybody. So that, that was the first thing that I had to touch on. The other thing is, Conlon, as I said it when we first opened up, he was supposed to be the chosen one for the, you know, in this case. He's with Top Rank. He's with the power. They got all the power. They got the network. They signed him up. He had won a bronze medal in the Olympics. He got robbed 
supposedly from, I didn't see the fight, but from all accounts, he got robbed uh, in the quarterfinals uh, uh, against, uh, was it the quarterfinals or the semis, against the Cuban. Um, I guess to win the bronze would be the quarters, right? Uh, or you have to win in the quarters to get to the bronze. But he, he got robbed against the Cuban for all accounts, and then he put his middle finger up, which went all over the world. Uh, he, he gave the middle finger to the judges, to the Aiba judges, which I don't blame him. Uh, I did four Olympics, most corrupt people I've ever met in my whole freaking life. I mean, and that's saying quite a bit because uh, professional boxing is, uh, is not much better. Uh, but it's just horrible, horrible. They finally got rid of Aiba after I went on the network uh, for years uh, screaming to get rid of them and you know all it did for me was uh get me removed from my front row seat but that's that's okay it, uh, we had to bring attention to something that was important that was destroying these young fighters lives that work so hard to get to the olympics and then they get their heart just torn out of them like a kung fu movie where the kung fu guy just rips your heart right out of your chest i mean that's what these incompetent and corrupt judges were doing as I did these Olympics with my partner Bob Popper for four Olympics, and you just watch one after another, these kids drop to the floor crying, crying because they've been robbed. Uh, but Conlon took it into his own hands. He gave the middle finger to the judges. It went viral. The picture went all over the world. And, you know, Aram has the money. He's got ESPN. He's, he knows how to promote. He said, hey, I could promote this guy. I could this this guy could be promoted. We could make money over here. So he signed them up, and then they went about their business. You know, building them up with handpicked. You know, the way everyone gets built up. If you have a promoter to you know to to pay the freight. If you don't, then you don't get the privilege of being built up that way. But he did, and they put him in with the guys that you put a prospect in with early to make sure that the record continues to build and continues to have a zero at the end of it uh and they did that with conley and they knew that they could b build them up in europe in ireland that they could build up uh, a gath you know a, a fan base i called some of his early fights on espn and i remember one of them where he was fighting one of these you know hand-picked guys and i said on the air which i was prone to saying what I believed, I said, if he doesn't finish this guy, I have to feel and have some doubts about how high the bar is for his future. I have no doubt he'll get to a world title fight because that's what they're going to do. They're going to get him. They're going to get him to that. But then he's going to be on his own. Then he's going to have no assistance. He's going to have to win it. And. If it's, you know, if he's in the right spot, he, he's obviously with all his amateur background and everything else, he's a decent boxer. he have a chance to win it. But I don't think it's as big a guarantee as everyone thinks because at this point, as I said, when I didn't see him, and I said it before the fight started, I didn't wait till afterwards. If he doesn't finish this guy, get this guy out of there. I think those were my exact words. Um, then I have to lower my thoughts of him as a top, 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 top prospect, you know? And obviously the top-ranked people, they didn't like it. They they didn't like it too much. They canceled my Christmas cards. And uh, Conlon, of course, didn't like it either. But I I went into this fight watching... And I'm watching for his development and where he was now compared to then. And, the f you know, he progressed, of course. But he had a guy, the way I saw the fight, I never thought Conlon was physically the strongest guy or the biggest puncher. And I know he scored the knockdowns and he heard Wood a couple times, so people are going to probably, you know take at me for that, which is fine because I know why I'm saying what I'm saying. But I never saw the physicality. And look, we've had plenty of boxers that don't have the physicality that obviously win world titles. But in this fight, I thought that hurt him. 
I thought I thought that Wood, even though he got, as you said, he got hurt, you know, he got dropped, and then he got hurt again in the second round, and he got he caught a couple other punches where he got buzzed during the fight too. I felt that that Wood was much stronger, much superior physically. Um, I thought he was a better puncher. I thought that he was just physically, he almost looked bigger, but he was physically stronger, more durable, if you will. And I thought that really played out during the course of the night, where, except for the first couple of rounds, he got caught in the first round, but he got caught a punch he didn't see. It was a loop in left hand. He, Conlon set it up beautifully. He, he bent low like he was going to go downstairs, and then he threw high. And so when you don't see a punch, it's going to really affect you. Sometimes it's going to knock you out. So Wood showed a great chin just surviving it. And both fighters showed unbelievable heart all night long, all night long. Grit, heart. They both behave like champions, um, quite frankly. So I want to make sure I get that out there very clearly. And he drops him. Luckily, it was the end of the round because Wood was, you know, he got caught a blind punch. He was hurt bad. He didn't, he didn't recover fully. In the second round, he was still hurt. And Conlon, you know, showed it. He, he, he wobbled him again. But he survived it because of his great grit, his great heart. Wood did. I thought even with that success, there was a flaw in the technique of Conlon that had never been corrected. And what it was was, and people, again, I understand where I'm putting myself. People are going to say, but Teddy, he hurt him, and he continued to catch him with that punch. I get it. But I felt that the left hand from the southpaw position that Conlon was throwing was too much of a loop. He never threw it straight. And when you throw it a loop, you get a lot of arm. And you lose the shoulder. You lose the body behind it. It's not as powerful as it could be. Now, I know it landed. I get it. But you can throw it that way. That could be in your arsenal. Great. But you can also throw it straight and get a little more power. What happens when you loop it is sometimes it works to your advantage, comes from that angle. But it takes a little longer to get there. And it doesn't have to shoulder in the body. It loses something in its power. I thought that stayed with him all night. I, I never saw I never saw a left hand that was straight, a straight left hand from the power position of the southpaw. Also, there was something else that I remember seeing at his very beginning of his career. He keeps he keeps his he, he keeps his hand uh, the lead hand low. Being a southpaw, of course, that would be the right hand. And But he puts himself against the rope, and he did it quite a few times. And he starts slipping and sliding, dipping and doing, you know, if you want to. dippity do, pop, 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 pop. And he's making you miss. And it it looks good. You know, it looks good. It looks kind of cool. You know, it, look, it looks like pretty smart like and it is you know you're making a guy miss you're making a guy miss but here's where the technical problem is if you're really going to break it down and not just say oh yeah he's making a miss but he's doing it with one hand low sometimes both so if you do get caught you're going to get caught clean and he's putting himself in a position where he's inviting too much offense. He's going up against the ropes, and he's putting himself in position where he's allowing you to throw at him, to have at him, if you will, to have, you know, kind of like being in a carnival. You go to the carnival, and, you know, they give you so many shots to, to you know, to shoot at the ducks in the water, you know, and you're, and you're shooting at it, and, you, you know, you got all these shots. He's putting himself on the ropes, in that kind of way, where he's letting you shoot at him, where all you're doing is making him miss. That's your mentality. That's your technique. But you're not in position to throw back. You're giving him extra shots at him where he knows you can't throw back. He understands that. He understands. So he's going to be more aggressive, more brave, if you will. But we don't need to even use that word. Both these guys were nothing but brave. But more confident, more aggressive because you're just there slipping and sliding 
and you're putting on a little bit of a show, yeah, and most of them are missing, yeah, but you're letting him throw six, seven, eight, five, whatever, rather than one or two because he knows, again, you can't throw back. And what's wrong with the technique is when you make a guy miss, you should be in tight enough where he can't throw another punch without the threat of one coming back and hitting him. In other words, you make him miss, you make him pay. And when the guy doesn't have the threat of that, well, the guy's going to throw more. And I thought that was his downfall. Uh, he got hurt in the 11th. He got hurt in the 11th. He was ahead to fight, but I thought it was closer, really closer than maybe the announcers thought because the way that Wood was coming on, he was coming on like a freight train down the track. And the other guy was fighting him nip and toe, uh, you know, right there, uh, toe to toe, fighting him. And the other guy being Conlon, fighting right with him. But Wood was coming on and he was showing his superior physical strength and and his aggression was wearing him down but in the 11th round he drops him and i know they made it controversial that he didn't really hit him he was slipped no he hit him he hit him with a left hook wood caught him a left hook and i thought the corner messed up a little bit and i understand where they were because i've been there they ran to the referee to complain that it wasn't really a legitimate knockdown. But they took away 30 seconds from getting their fighter recovered, revived. They forgot that their fighter was hurt. And he went back, and they, he could have used that extra 30 seconds to help him recover, to help him revive, you know. And I know I'm going probably, I'm doing the x-ray machine thing. I'm giving you guys everything that I saw at least, even if you didn't hear it, you know, that night. And... I felt that by going after the ref about, you know, that it shouldn't have counted as a knockdown, and I understand it, again, their fighter was hurt, and he wasn't getting the, you know, he wasn't getting the ice on him, the water on him, the, you know, the, the, the help, the help to recover uh, for those 20, 30 seconds that you were chasing after the ref. I thought when he came out in the 12th, he was still hurt. But more importantly than me, Wood knew he was hurt. His instincts were good. Wood knew he was hurt. Wood, Wood, was, he, Wood was like a lion that knew he had an injured gazelle and nothing was going to stop him from, you know, from the finish, you know, from having supper, so to speak. Nothing, nothing. And that's how Wood came across to me. Like this guy who was an unrelenting force all night long with another guy who was just as tough. But at the end there, Wood, he knew, and we might get him on a program. I know we're reaching out to him, and I'd love to ask him this, this question because I feel 100% sure of the answer. I would just say to him, Lee, you knew you were going to knock him out that last round, didn't you? You you just, your engine was running hot. You were after him. You saw how he was wearing down. And there was no doubt in your mind you you can do what you had to do to get rid of him and you felt you were going to get rid of him. That's how it came across to me, that he knew that he would just keep that pressure on, he'd get rid of him. And this was a great example. I often talk about the seashore. I use it as an analogy, that the waves come in and they always take something with them. They take sand. They take part of the beach with them as they come in. And the beach is a little less because of that. That's what this fight represented to me, Ken, was the waves kept coming. You know, wood was the waves. Kept coming, no matter what, no matter what. was. He was slowed down, he was hit, he was hurt here and there. But the waves, especially after the midway point especially the 78th the 9th the 10th you know of course the 11th but the the waves kept coming and even if we didn't notice he noticed and conlon felt it the sand some of the sand from the beach was taken away some of conlon was taken away with every one of those waves and just that relentless pressure you know, I, and I don't think it broke him mentally. 
I, I usually talk about the mental side, but it really, and that's part of it, but it really broke him physically. He physically, his will, his relentless will, and his superior physical strength, Wood's superior physical strength broke down piece by piece, wore down Conlon until you finally saw the end result of it in the 12th round. You finally saw it. But it was happening. It was happening. But the other guy was so gallant, Conlon, that you might not have realized it was happening. You might not have realized it was happening because he was fighting him tooth and nail. But it was happening. The guy that was stronger, for me, was gonna, he was going to get there. And he was getting there just the old-fashioned way of being relentless and, of course, using his physicality uh, to do what he was doing. And that body attack. I know they were both going to the body. They were both going to the body great. Um, Conlon was too. But those harder body shots and clean ones by Wood was also just, it was taken away from Conlon and the right hands that you like to use against the southpaw when I was calling the fights I, always, I called them southpaw killers those right hands of the head were landing periodically and then of course it landed at the very end um, you know uh, where it finished the job but I think the job was really done all night long just you know he just it's like keeping your oven on and cooking something. I mean, the oven just kept cooking and cooking and cooking until finally uh, Conlon was, if you will, baked. Um, and that final right hand finished it. Uh, tremendous fight. Uh, again, one of the epic comebacks. You know, uh, I, I had it. I didn't score it, but I had it in my mind. You know, they were saying, oh, he's so far ahead. By the way he was coming on down the stretch, and then, of course, the 10-8 round in the 11th. Ken, I had it, quite frankly, everyone said if he didn't knock him out, he wouldn't win. And I know the scorecards were, I think two of them were one point, one of them was two or three points. You're, you can confirm that for me. But... Two um, judges, two judges had Mick Conlon up by one point going into the last round, and one judge had him up by three, I believe. So all Conlon, even if even if Conlon stayed on his feet and lost ten nine, he still would have got a majority draw. Yeah, but um, he wasn't going to get that because he got right. You know, well, no, no, you're right. But what the point I was saying was, without being privy to those scores, I felt going in that he didn't have to have a knockout to win. I mean, obviously, it, it helps if you get a knockout, then there's, you don't have to worry about it. But I felt because of the way he had been coming on, because of the 10-8, 11th round, um, because of the way that this round, it was a competitive round, but you could see he had the edge. The way that this round was going, I felt that, and it turned out that way, but I felt that, even without the knock, the knockout, uh, he could win a fight. And as it turned out, obviously he could because if he wins the round, as you started to say, um, without a knockdown, if he wins the round, then, then it, it's a draw. But the way the fight had gone already, we got past that point. He had already dropped him. If he survived, if he had survived that, Conlon, and he got back in the ring, and he finished the fight. Wood would have won the world title. I felt, again, without knowing the score, would have, scores, would have won the world title without having to have the knockout. And um, anyway, he, he got it the old-fashioned way. He let his hands get it for him. He didn't worry about the judges. Although I think the judges, except for the three-point I would argue with, I think the judges were pretty much right on uh, 
for the job. I have a feeling those judges were on their P's and Q's after the uh, Catterall fight in uh, the UK the week before or two weeks before, whenever it was. I feel like that was scored, That the judges scored this one pretty accurately and pretty fairly. Yeah, I, it's good to have incentive, you know, to, to be <laughs> honest. You shouldn't have to. Yeah. It should be part of your nature, especially when that's your job. <laughs> your job is to be honest. But uh, it's good to give them a little extra incentive like we're watching you and we're going to send you to jail if you don't do it well you know something like that but uh, unfortunately we can't send them to jail because we don't have a strong enough police in boxing yeah you know who took the biggest l on the night i think is top rank having lost the purse bid to the zone and seeing this incredible fight Shown on DAZN instead of ESPN. I think they bid 1.2 and DAZN bid 1.5. But, man, they got their money's worth out of this one. That was that was one for the ages. I mean, everyone was talking about this fight. I feel like I feel like top rank. Oh, yeah, top rank. <laughs> man, they're not doing really well with the purse bids because they lost the Cambosa, um, Cambosa versus Tiafimo Lopez via purse bid as well, which turned out to be one of the biggest upsets in a long time. They uh they don't want to get uh they don't want to be aggressive on those purse bids and the zone keeps outbidding them and getting these great fights. That is factual. Um, they, you know, they got the money. I know they get. I know that they're, they're not gonna. There's not gonna be a uh, a food line for them. I mean, <laughs> I, I I I know no one's gonna have to do a benefit uh, for them. Uh, you know, I don't know what they're doing with their money if they're not trying to win purse bits with all that uh, cash that ESPN's given them. But uh, nobody, you know, there's rumors out there that they're not fiscally sound, um, quite frankly, top rank. That, uh, you know, they might be for sale um, and the price might not be quite as big as you would want it or think that it would be. Put it this way, uh, there's been there's been rumors that they're not in the greatest uh, financial condition in the world, and and if that's the case, maybe that speaks. You know, you would wonder why they're not because they do get a pretty good amount of cabbage uh, from from uh, the mouse, but uh, that would be Mickey Mouse. But you wonder, you wonder if uh, being that they're that tight with some of these purse bids and not winning them, not going out there to win them. And, uh, you know, you wonder about them in those kind of, in those kind of areas. Who knows? Uh, again, there's, there's no pity party for them. There's no, uh, I don't think anyone's going to run a benefit for them. But uh, I'm sure that their fighters would appreciate if they won some of those purse bids because it does make a difference where you fight. You know, I always talk about the geography in the ring, which, of course, is the most important thing. Who owns the geography in the ring that benefits them with their physical abilities the most? You know, do you need to be inside? Do you need to be fighting on the outside because you have good legs, you're longer, you're not as physical, you know, you're a real strong guy, you want to be on the inside, who wins the geography in a ring is so important. But the geography outside the ring of where the fight takes place, man, that could be pretty damn important uh, in this business. Who knows? Wood would, would, with his crowd chanting him on that that didn't add to, you know, his success a little bit, right? I mean, you know, I, I mean... You, you got the crowd chanting you on and that energy in the air. I know you're alone in the ring. I understand that better than most people. But still, that that energy in the air, it doesn't hurt. And then, of course, the most important part of it is when you got that home cooking, well, sometimes the judges can be a little nicer to you, just a little nicer to you and give you ice cream. 
yeah, like I said, tough loss for uh, top rank to see those two fights go to the zone in like you know a short span of time. I I, I would assume that the 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 next purse bid, the the top rank fighter is going to be on the receiving end of probably an overpaying for one of these purse bids just to get one back on the uh, just to get back in the win column. My God, you don't want to keep seeing your young, or in Tiafimo's case, your. Um, superstar champion go to another network and lose and lose on both occasions like you said you know you're gonna put the fight in in the other promoters uh let the other promoter do the do the work and hire the judges and hire the referee it's uh <laughs> it's not exactly a winning formula for your fighters no i want to i want to add that um that's why i always say when you watch this fight ken i always say and i always will say that Fighters can never get paid enough because, and and like I've always said for years on the air, you know, and now somebody else might be saying it over there somewhere. Um, <laughs> but I, I would always say the reason why I feel they can never be overpaid is when a fighter goes in a ring, he leaves the ring with less of himself than he entered the ring with. And that was so apparent the other night. Conlon left, both of them left the ring with less of themselves. And so when I always, I'm always on the side of the fighter when it comes to being paid. And that's why, that's why, because of, of the risks that they take. You, you, I don't care Floyd got, you know, 300 million one night, right? Somewhere in that area. I, I think it was the crossover fight. So it's a little bit of a different animal. I get it. But I don't care if he got 800 million. Uh, he deserves whatever he can get. All these fighters deserve, because of what I just said, whatever they can get. And I always talk about being a champion. It's more than just how you fight. It's how you behave. They both behave like champions. It, it really is more than how you fight. You know, it's more than just how quick your jab is and how good your footwork is, you know, how perfect your left hook is. No, it's, it's about the behavior of a champion, the character of a champion. And boy, oh boy, that was never more on display or more evident than it was, you know, the other night. I mean, it was just, it was tremendous. If you do, you have anything else on this uh, on this fight? Because if not, I want to talk to you about. Uh, one no, of no, I, the only thing I would finish with, and I think I probably finished already. Is the only thing maybe greater than the fight was what we touched on earlier, Ken. The class displayed, you know, by Wood. Um, you know, I mean, the heart, the grit by both fighters. But the class displayed by Wood at the end, refusing to celebrate probably the one of the greatest things in his life, um, refusing to celebrate it until he knew if his opponent was okay. Uh, that was That was spectacular. Yeah, congratulations to Lee Wood, and hopefully we can uh, get in touch with him and have him come on the show and uh, give him a proper congratulations and uh, maybe maybe introduce him to some of the American fans that might not have been aware of him before the fight. Well, before we get to uh, an up a, a, a young rising star in the UFC, I want to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor, Teddy Athletic Greens, one of the best tasting green drinks on the market. I take this stuff every day. I know you like it and have. Been let me using ask you a question. It. Let me ask, let me ask you a question. Uh, seriously, and and we don't we don't we pride ourselves in not you know uh, chirping away just because we are for the sake of chirping and because we have a sponsor. We want to know that whatever we're chirping about, whatever we're back and we, we 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 know about it and we believe in it. And having said that, what do you feel that you've you talked about how quickly you're healing from your surgery. Do you do you feel that that being part of your your diet, your nutrition has helped? 100% I think nutrition and sleep are the two most important things when it comes to physical training and uh, people ask me all the time because of the success I've had late in life in running um, what kind of supplements I take and I tell everyone if there's one thing if I could only take one of the things that I take it would be athletic greens it's just basically whole food sourced ingredients and that's the most important element is like nature's vitamins whole food sourced ingredients 75 vitamins minerals it's got probiotics prebiotics it literally 
literally has everything you need. It's like a multivitamin in a good in a nice tasting uh, green drink. I put it in about a cup of water, shake it up in the shaker that they provide with the package, and uh, boom, you're done. Super easy. Couldn't it be more convenient? If you use the promo code ATLAS when you order it, go to athleticgreens.com, use the promo code ATLAS, you'll get 10 free travel packs with your first purchase, and I think that that's a... Um, you know, it's easy to think about some of these free offers with your first purchase as like kind of throwaway, but I value those travel packs because I take them with me everywhere I go. I actually order a bag and 30, 30 individual um, travel packs because I travel so much. So I never miss a day with this stuff. I love it. The guys over there are great. They're doing great things. And um, yeah, our listener special offer, use the promo code ATLAS to get 10 free travel packs with your, for, with your first purchase. I'd fill out the subscription plan if I were you and just make sure it comes every month so you never miss. Like I said, I don't go a day without it. And with that, Let's talk about the young star, Kamzat Shamayev. The uh, young superstar out of the UFC is 10-0, uh, and 0, fighting out of Sweden. I see Darren Till's over there training with him now. Everyone I've heard from, Chell Son and uh, Darren Till, they talk about this guy's training and work ethic, and he's just a killer. And I mean, he's been just mauling people and smashing people in the UFC. Most recently, he fought the, um, I'm spacing on the kid's name, the Chinese kid. One second. He just like picked him up, picked him up from behind and was like carrying him across the ring and like yelling at Dana White as he's carrying this guy. I mean, it was kind of humiliating for the um, for the opponent. But my God, it was impressive. That was against uh, Zhang Long, Zhang, Zhang, Zhang Lang Li. Um, back at the uh, UFC 267, Blahovich versus Texera. And um, he's just been on a tear. And I know you've had a chance to watch some of his previous fights. He's got um, Gilbert Burns coming up. They're talking about him getting a, a potential title shot or maybe a, um, who are they talking about? Crack at uh, Colby Covington after this one. It just seems like he's moving so fast through the ranks. I'm dying to hear your thoughts on this kid after you've had a chance to look at some of his fights. Before I go into that, you mentioned a name. You mentioned the great Chael Sonnen. And for you fans that didn't see our last week's podcast where we had both Chell and Anthony Smith on. I was out in Vegas, and they were out in Vegas, obviously doing the same thing I was doing. I was covering with them because obviously they're the experts when it comes to this stuff, to the MMA stuff. But they were gracious enough to allow me to go with them on ESPN during the coverage of the Masvidal Covington fight so they were good enough to come on with us the Monday after the fight and break it down in our episode last week um, they were magnificent I, I know I said it to them directly uh, when we did that show but I have to say it again for those of you who didn't see that episode go see it really see that that episode with me and Ken with Chell and with Anthony breaking down what happened in uh, UFC 272 with Masvidal and Covington. It, it was that good that it forced me to say it again. As far as Tremayev, well, here's my breakdown of this prodigy because he looks like a prodigy. Uh, obviously, this budding superstar. He's undefeated. For me, that's one of his strengths. Why? Because he hasn't learned how to lose, and he fights that way. Like, he doesn't want to learn, and he's never going to learn. He fights with that kind of supreme confidence where that's not, that's not so easy to say. You know, not everyone fights with that supreme confidence, where they, that belief, where they know there's only one result when they get into that ring or in this case that cage and the result's going to be them you know being the winner uh obviously uh i i, I think about him a little bit uh, i can't help it when i see these guys who are so good on the mat um and so serious and so talented and so technically solid too it reminds me a little bit of Makachev, Makachev, uh, who's a protege of uh, the great Khabib, uh, 
he reminds me in, in that class and all the when I talk about these guys in these kind of special ways that I am right now obviously it all connects for me at least to Khabib maybe the greatest of all time who retired 29 and 0 I believe that's what he retired but that's that that shows you how great he is and how great I think he is just to bring me to a name like that. You know, I know he's got a long way to go, but to bring me to a name like that, that it, it connects me to him, it speaks volume for what he shows me in so many ways. First of all, he's a superior wrestler. That's 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 evident on the mat. Um, smart. Forget about the ferociousness and all that stuff. To see it. smart and just great technique. You know, he could be the strongest. I often said about Mike Tyson, how strong he was, what a great punch he was with the hand. But that wouldn't have meant anything really if he didn't have the technique to use those qualities. Make a guy miss, get inside a guy, take away his jab, <laughs> you know, go to the body, go to the head, make him miss, make him pay, um, create openings. Without the technique, that ability, you know, wouldn't have been recognized on the stage that it was recognized to the level that it was recognized, to the level that it was obviously, uh, that it produced what it produced. This guy has that to go with the talent. He's so strong, uh, but he's so smart. His technique is unreal. His pressure is relentless. Uh, he, I talk about fighters, and I'm going to use the same parallel here with, with this UFC budding star, right? I talk, Ken, about, you know, you can have a great ability, a great punch, but it doesn't mean anything if you don't have a delivery system to get it to the target. You hear me say that a lot. And the fans hear me say that a lot. And matter of fact, in Ganyu, who's a tremendous champion, and he pulled off a unbelievable win against showed his versatility in his smarts we know how big and strong he is against Gan, and he's been on our show and we love him uh but he i remember somebody sent me the interview where he was talking about what was in front of him and the fights coming up and he said he said like teddy has said to me yeah i'm powerful yeah i'm strong but it doesn't mean anything if i don't have a delivery system i remember hearing him say that and so it echoes as it speaks his truth obviously not just because it comes out of my mouth because it lives inside the ring it lives with these fighters as truth that you have to have a delivery system so you're a great puncher you have to have a delivery system to get it to the target otherwise the value of the punch is meaningless well that's what I saw in Shemaev, that his great ability is, one of his greatest ability, he's got a lot of them, but one of his greatest ability that he's becoming pretty damn uh, known for is his ability on the floor, on the mat. But to get there, to use that, you have to have a delivery system. I'll call it an entry system. <laughs> uh, when it comes to to him and to the UFC. I will adjust it to the entry system. He's got an entry system. It's one thing to be a great grappler, great jiu-jitsu, great wrestler, whatever, but you got to be inside to use it. You have to have an entry system, and you got to get there clean and safe. Wow, I watched this guy to prepare to do this synopsis of him, if you will, and I saw a great entry system. I saw three different ways that he has an entry system where one, he'd throw a punch to miss on purpose just to distract his opponent to get him close, to keep him defensive and get him close. The other one I saw, Ken, was extraordinary. I saw him walk a guy down, press the guy to force the guy to throw a strike. The guy threw a punch. He slipped it as good as a boxer would slip it. And and then he was 
off the slip instead of throwing a counter on left hook because he slipped to his left instead of and I want Rob to try to get that clip if he can and and Rob's great at this stuff and I bet you he gets it uh for us but he he walks the guy down the opponent down I don't remember his name and he slips the punch to his left makes a miss instead of countering with a left hook now he's got him where he can close the gap safely and get him on the mat and destroy him <laughs> you know it's like watching a leopard take uh, track down you know its prey and then take it to its lair <laughs> where he can eat it you know uh to the tree and climb up the tree with it in his drawer and lay it out on a tree branch i hope nobody's getting ready to eat right now and lay it out on the tree branch and then you know go and you know enjoy his uh just rewards he his lair is on the floor and so he slipped the punch he got in i was like wow wow then another one he uses is you throw a, a high leg kick get you to defend that and while you're defending the leg kick bang he closes the gap again and gets to where he wants to get to safely entry system he gets inside uh so that's enough if I just said that and left it at that, those superlatives are enough to say this guy's pretty damn good and he's going to go pretty damn. But I got more. His striking, what I've seen of it, you know, the amount of it that I've seen, you know, it's obviously it doesn't jump out maybe as much as the, the wrestling abilities on the mat, but man, it struck, it stuck out to me. I, I saw a guy who's accurate. He doesn't waste any. He's like the great Japanese world champion in a way where he doesn't waste anything. His legs are always in position. Again, technique. He's always balanced. <laughs> He's never out of position. His legs are under him, so he doesn't, he doesn't reach in where you can counter him. He's in position, and he's got the power because his legs are under him where he can deliver that punch with his whole body. He... He's accurate. He's laser accurate. Laser accurate. As I said, he don't throw something unless he thinks it's going to land, except with the entry. He'll purposely throw something to miss to get close. But other than that, when he's in a striking mode, wow. I mean, again, power. He hits guys, he hurts them, and he hits them clean. He throws with great timing. And that's another thing. He's got great eyes. He's got great vision. He's got great instincts. I saw it. I watched for it. Where he'll see the opening. He'll see what punch he should throw. There was one clip I watched of him where he decided to throw an uppercut as the other guy was. It was amazing. The other guy was throwing a punch. And usually maybe you see inside where your guy, a timer guy, where I'll brag about it. And I'll say, wow, give him, give him credit for that. He threw a right hand inside the left hook. Well, there was a little space with the left hook. He saw it, and he shot a right hand inside that space. Well, Shemaev threw an uppercut. I, it was really something. Inside of a punch that he knew he could beat, he could get to the target with the uppercut before the guy could get to the target with the punch he was throwing. So he's got timing. He's got eyes. He's got instincts. He's calm in an uncalm place where he can see all those things which is imperative. Uh, he, he's got it all. He, for me, he, he's, he's got it all. I thought Khabib at the end of his career had improved with his jab, you know, because we knew what he was on the floor. He, it, it was lights out, you know, for the most part. I mean, it was, you know, you're, you're, you're going to jail <laughs> and, you're, and you're not getting out. There's no key to that, you know, to that, that cell uh once he puts you in it there's there's no key to get out um i see that with chamayev and i saw with khabib whether his striking had improved i see chamayev striking is already for me already at a pretty high level from what i've seen uh he's not a one-trick pony he's not a one-trick pony he's as i said he's he, we know about the ground game that all that stuff um, but again, when he strikes, he's accurate. 
Uh, he, he's, he's effective. Um, he's a sharpshooter. He's a surgeon with those punches that I've seen. I, I'll finish by saying his ground game, obviously his floor game is frightening, but his striking looks pretty scary. Uh, it's like going to someone's house and there's a lion at the front door and a tiger at the back door and an alligator in the living room. You better go to someone else's house. <laughs> I, I, think that, I think that you would be well advised, go find someone else, else's freaking house to hang out in. 10 and 0 as a pro, all 10 finishes. 3 and 0 as an amateur, all three by finish, by stoppage. He's on a roll. I think I think if there was any uh, critique of him trying to get a title shot, they'd say, look, he's got like three, I think three or four wins in the um, in the UFC, four wins in the UFC. Um, I think some people would like to see him get some top 10 guys in there, maybe even top five before they talk about him for a title shot. But nevertheless, he's making noise. And uh, listen, the, 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 the squeaky wheel gets the grease in the UFC. We saw Conor McGregor did it. He talked himself right through the ranks. I mean, he obviously, in addition to beating and people up sometimes you got to make some demands and make some noise out there and Shamaya's definitely done that and uh, uh you know gone about it gone about that it, getting people's attention in the right way and uh he backs up everything he says so if this continues look for him to get a uh probably a shot at Colby Covington if he can get through Gilbert Burns and then most likely a title shot should be interesting to see what happens here yeah you listen as you very accurately stated and responsibly you still got to go through some of the stages you know you still got to go through you look unbelievable we get it um but you still got to step up with the competition in, in a couple of those phases some guys are so good they they skip a phase but um you have to go through some of those phases now uh to be in there with you know the experience the the the, the more experienced guys that he's been in there with guys that experience but you know to start to go to that next level um where you can show yourself which i don't think he needs to show himself i think he's that much of a believer but you show yourself that you belong i get it but right now just being a guy that obviously thinks a lot of this a lot of him um, and just to be a fan for a second, if if I could just be, you know, just have a wish list, nothing to do with weight classes. I don't even know the weight classes. The, nothing to do with weight classes. Not, nothing to do with, you know, what stage they're at, you know, and that you have to get this stage before you go to that stage. But eventually, if I had a wish list, I, I'd... Love to see him with Usman. I mean, you know, I uh, again put weight classes aside, but I'd love to see him with Usman, and I'd love to see him with the other, you know, protege that just protege talent that we see also in the UFC. I mentioned him earlier. Uh, Makachev. 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 Islam Makachev. Yeah. I, I, again, forget about weight classes. I know that I don't think they're in the same weight class, but I'm not sure. But, I mean, those are the – that's how good this guy is. And when you got a guy that good, you want to see him tested with the best out there. And that's that's how – those would be for me – fights that would be you know it's like a kid going to a candy store you know that <laughs> Markachev you know. Markachev is at lightweight 155 um the other guy's at 170 but Rob just pointed out that Gilbert Burns is um is ranked number three the only two people ranked above Gilbert Burns would be Covington and uh Usman if, if he can get through Gilbert Burns he's basically he's he's almost there you know, either a title shot next, or he gets through, Col or he gets Covington. Yeah, and he's fighting a real guy with Burns, obviously. And um, oh yeah, you know, all these guys are real guys, really, to be honest. But um, there's no, you know, there's no uh, free rides in Dana White's world. You know, that's why these guys, that's why these guys, 
And and Shale Sonnen made a good point in that interview last week. That's why losing a fight in the UFC is not a death sentence. You know, matter of fact, it's it's the opposite. You you're gaining experience. You're gaining the ability to be as good as you can be. You you know by being in there with top guys that you might lose a fight, you might lose two, you might lose three, but you are showing yourself to be on a certain level, and you're learning from those, and that's why it's not unusual to see a guy with five losses, three losses, seven losses, whatever, wind up beating an undefeated fighter, a top guy in the UFC. It's not unusual because they get put in with tough competition right from the beginning, and they either disappear and go into another industry or they become better, they grow, they mature, they develop. And, you know, sometimes in boxing, you'll see a guy just taken care of. You know, I talk about it many times. Taken care of with, you know, polite fights, if you will, where the promoter is giving him, you know, hand-picked guys, right? And, um, and then is he really doing him a favor? Because he's got an undefeated record, and then he gets... To that place where now you can't help him with the hand picking. He's got to fight whoever's there. And sometimes he's not ready. Sometimes right there, you see it. And these guys in the UFC, they're always, they're always ready. They're always ready because they're not no, being so given sure. layups and slam dunks in their career. They're, they're being given real fights. And yeah, they're going to lose their, you know, they're going to lose their undefeated record sometimes but they're going to be it's going to pay off for them because they're going to be down the road the fighter that they could be that they were supposed to be and they're going to wind up pulling off some upsets before they they leave the sport because of that but um yeah i knew that mikhochev was a different weight class uh obviously i uh, smaller makhachev smaller than than Chemayev, but I'm just talking of the way a fan would talk. I'm just talking that those, those kind of mentalities, those kind of styles, those kind of talents, oh, my God. Uh, it's, it's a dream for someone like me if, if you could put those kind of guys together, if you could make them the right weight or the same weight, you know. But also, if you could see uh, – if you could see – uh, Chemayev with a Covington or or an Usman or wow, wow. But he's got to get past a, a really, as we always talk about with the UFC, a really tough test. I mean, uh, uh, in 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 Burns, I think he will. But uh, he's got a re he's got a real dude in front of him, uh, so to speak. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. Rob says that a lot of the fans are asking to see uh, Makachev step up and fight Covington, I guess, at 170. But that seems a bit unfair to ask the guys, like, you know, fight, go heading towards a title shot at 155 to jump up and fight another another prospect at 170. Seems like he's got bigger fish to fry at lightweight. Yeah, I agree. No, and you I, know who's I in agree. action next week? Friend of the show, Patty the Batty Pimblet is uh, UFC Fight Night co-main next week. That should be a good one. He's an exciting guy, you know. He drips excitement. <laughs> you know, you know yep. what I mean. I mean, he's his name starting with his name, and of course, <laughs> uh, you know, he's got star written all over him. Which, you know, which uh, sometimes you talk about star just from talent standpoint, but other times it's a mix of charisma and talent. You know, uh, that's right. If you will, ring presence, ring presence. Yeah, and and he's got that too. He's got that too. For sure. Yep. Signed with uh, Barstool Sports as their first um, first sponsored pro athlete, I think, uh, ever for Barstool Sports. So that tells you what a big, uh, what, what kind of star power uh, Patty has. Those guys tend to be very uh, topical and in touch with what the fans like. So anyway, we covered a lot today, Teddy. You got anything else before we say goodbye? No, just I guess I'll finish with what I started with, our uh, prayers. And thoughts to the people, uh, the people in the Ukraine, uh, and and the, as I said, the people around the world that are suffering 
uh, when they shouldn't have to suffer. That's all. And uh, yeah. I appreciate all the fans that, you know, that build our, that comprise our audience and um, that are always there and that are building this thing that we're doing here. We were, I think we're at about 235,000 subscribers. I think we're in that area, somewhere around there, and about close to 50 million downloads, or um, I know we're close to that. But uh, I think we're subscribers. We're somewhere around there. And uh, I would ask you, I would say thank you. And then I would ask you, if you want us to hang around, keep going. Keep building it. <laughs> keep building it. And then we'll hang around. Yep. And with that, guys, thanks for being with us. We'll be back next week to break down all the action in the UFC and talk about Patty's performance. So uh, best of luck to Patty Pimblett. And with that, take care, guys. Everyone have a great week. <laughs>